But today we're going to be uh, continuing in our uh, study on the book of James, the blueprint for living out our life of faith. Uh, lesson 9 out of 12 lessons tonight, so we're kind of closing in on the, on the home stretch. Uh, today we're going to be talking about submit yourself to God. It was about a, a week and a half ago, I think. It was a Sunday night after uh, Sean had preached that uh, evening service, and he went to the book of James in a sermon, and he, he gave some examples that uh, pretty much what I said a few weeks ago. So I was in the foyer after, and I, I forgot who I was talking to, but I was like, I guess my lessons are going okay because Sean's already still in my material. And then it just so happened that Todd was walking by, and, and he says, it's actually God's material. And I, it just, he just so happened to be holding the mic, and he just dropped it right then. But, so he was taking my pride and shoving it down. So, so today, as we uh, talk about submitting yourself to God, uh, you know, pride is a big part of that uh, that we're going to be talking about a little bit today. As I get started, being at baseball season and uh, talking about submitting ourselves to God, I'm going to read a story that I found that kind of gets our minds right to where, uh, kind of to get it started. It was written by Chad Grambling uh, sometime last year, and it was written about uh, Yogi Berra. Uh, I think most, most of us have heard of Yogi Berra. I don't like that he played for the Yankees, but he was a, a historical figure uh, and, and baseball player. And the story goes like this. Baseball had lost one of its greatest personalities when Yogi Berra passed away. In addition to being a great player, manager, and war veteran, Berra was well known for his yogiisms. Have we heard about those before? Yogiisms. Upon first hearing many, they sound offbeat and or insane, only to prove quite truthful when further considered. Some of my favorite yogiisms in include, if you don't know where you're going, you might end up someplace else. And nobody goes there anymore because it's too crowded. But another one that perplexes people more often is this one. When you get to the fork in the road, take it. I love this for many reasons. I'll detail. But before I do, I have to mention an explanation shared by someone being interviewed on ESPN radio. According to the story, Yogi once lived on a cul-de-sac or road that went in a full circle so that whether you turned left or whether you turned right, when you got to the fork, if you took it either direction, you'd make it to his house. So he told people, when you get to the fork, take it. How should we respond to forks in the road? A fork in the road is not an easy proposition because it forces a decision. We first decide if we are to progress onward, and if so, which path to take. Surely, in pursuing life with progress in mind, going backwards is not an appealing option. Though it may be necessary at times in life, and it may prove to be the best of all options available. When you come to the fork in the road, take it. Suppose we are, are forward-focused and therefore have an easy decision. Another de decision looms. Which way forward should we go? Sometimes, if we have the de destination in view, the path that is most likely to most likely to get us there is the one we will choose. Other times, all options might prove to be challenging, difficult, or seem impossible. In those moments, we freeze. We stop dead in our tracks and wait. That can be sometimes good. It can also be bad, very bad. Why not taking the fork and road can be bad? In Yogi's case, no matter which direction that's chosen, you achieve the desired end result. Our decisions in life usually don't include that wonderful luxury. The unknown, or perhaps the fear of what we think we know, all too often keeps us from taking that action. We become sails without wind. We lay in waiting and may never take another step forward. Why? That's why it is important for us to remember that the Lord is our shepherd who lovingly cares for us, even when we journey down difficult paths. He never leaves us. 
He guides us and writes our direction. For that reason, paralyzing fear exhibits a general lack of t- trust in God. Ironically, in our trust of God, our faithfulness, he makes our path known and prepares us throughout life for each and every moment ahead. He ultimately guides us to our final destination. And even though we don't always follow the script, God always is directing our lives. So I thought that was a good story to kind of uh, to, to get us started. You know, I, I thought it kind of sets the stage for wanna, where I want to go uh, this evening. You know, we are, as Christians specifically, we're always asked to make decisions, right? And as a Christian, our decisions are sometimes a little more difficult because we have to, you know, we're, we're trying to submit to God in, in his directions and not the directions that we could take when we're looking at the world. You know, this story is about following God and having faith in God and always be ready to take an action, you know, and kind of not be a, a person on the sideline, but being someone who's in the game and ready to, to do something about it. You know, that's, I think that's true, but because sometimes, you know, it's, it's easier decision to not do anything, but what we're going to talk about today is making that decision and how to make that decision and what happens when we take that, make that wrong decision. In this picture here on the screen, we can go left or we can go right or we can do what the story says or what it says not to do and do nothing and turn around, right? In this particular situation, we have three options. There's a psychology app uh, called Noom and it, it says that an average adult makes an average of 122 informed choices every day. So if we break that down, we are making decisions every 11 minutes. And we're not talking about whether to wear, you know, uh, brown slacks or black slacks. We're talking about decisions that are more important, decisions that maybe are long-lasting or maybe decisions that will affect others. And sometimes I don't think we think about that, but we're making decisions all throughout the day. And today I want to focus on how we make these decisions and what James says is the outcome of the, the, based on who we are following. Are we submitting to God or are we submitting to something else? I'm not sure if you remember, but about three years ago or so, we had a pandemic. Y'all remember about that? Um, so something that happened during the pandemic, it, it at least affected me and my work when we're caring for elderly people, is uh, one of the decisions was to not let friends and visitors in to see the residents. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say this as you know, let's assume that they were making that decision for the good. The, the thought process, I think, was if we limit the people coming in, then it's less risk that those elderly people are going to get the virus, right? But what we didn't think about, or what we know now, when looking back on it 2020, is a lot of other things happen, whether they feel isolation or mental and a lot of things that maybe weren't thought of when the decision was made, but we see them now. So I think that's another thing I, I wanted to think about, and I'm not here to, to debate whether you know, we handle the, the pandemic right or wrong, but to think about, the, you know, I, I guess the lesson is, sometimes when we make decisions, we might not see the overall effect of our decisions. We might see what we think is going to happen in our one decision that we make, but a lot of times it affects other things, which is another reason that we have to submit to God when we're making our decisions, because he knows what's going to happen long term. Last week, Joel talked about two, two kinds of wisdom. And I'm going to give you a little refresher because it ties in to what we're going to talk about today. He doesn't know it, but I pulled some adjectives right off his, his slides onto my slides. So he, we talked about two, two kinds of wisdom. The first one was worldly wisdom. 
earthly, unspiritual, sensual, demonic, envy, selfish ambition, leads to disorder, leads to evil practices. And then we talked about heavenly wisdom. Pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, produces good fruit, impartial, sincere. When we're talking about submitting to God, we'll learn in our text today in chapter 4 that these adjectives really are a parallel to what we're talking about, whether we're submitting to the world or if we're submitting to God. You know, we can either submit ourselves to God or we can submit ourselves to something other than God. That might be the world, that might be something else, somebody else, somebody we see on TV. So it's either God or something else. A key verse today that we're going to get into in a minute is, is chapter 4, verse 6, and it says, But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So when we come to that fork, like we talked about a minute ago, or we're ready to make a decision or take an action, what do we do? We can, we can say go left, which is worldly desires, full of others with personal pride, selfish ambition, ideas that come from the world, or we can take the other direction, which is a direction that comes from godly desires, full of humble people trying to live the way God tells us to, the scriptures tells us to. You know, I, I think as Christians, like I said, we know which direction to take, I think, but it's hard sometimes. You know, if, if it wasn't hard, we wouldn't need to, to have these lessons. Uh, but the world makes it hard for us. So today we're going to look at what James says about the first path when we follow worldly desires. But he's also going to talk about the reward when we follow godly desires. So let's uh, get into the text. I'm going to read the whole uh, text today. We're in chapter 4, 1 through 12, starting in verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. You may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. Or do you think, Scripture says without reason, that he jealously longs for the spirit that has caused to dwell in us. But he gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says God opposes the God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting, in judgment, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? So James says, we are living in a land of worldly desires, and that brings what? He says it brings fighting, wars, battles. You know, if, if we go back to the, to the adjectives here, he's talking about the worldly, worldly wisdom, just like worldly desires. Earthly, unspiritual, and at the end, leads to disorder, leads to evil practices, and that's what James talks about here. Following God is pure and peace-loving. So when God talks about following the world, 
he says we have a lot of battles and wars. And I think he gives us three ways that we battle. The first one is we battle within ourselves. How do we battle within ourselves? You know, I think maybe we have too much pride. That's what it says in James. You know, pride turns into selfish desires. Maybe we think we know better than somebody else, or maybe we're more important than other people. You know, James says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? And he says, those desires come from a battle within you. Sometimes, you know, we have selfish desires, and sometimes we'll do whatever it takes to get that selfish desire. You know, the text says even to kill and covet. So we can do a, a lot of crazy things to get what we want at times. You know, if we go back to the beginning, uh, when we talk about Cain and Abel, what happened there? Cain was jealous of Abel, wasn't he? He was jealous because he was envious of what Abel was able to bring. So he had conflict within himself. And we know what happened, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Earthly desires create conflict. So when we think about ourselves, what are some things that maybe we fight with in, inside that cause a battle inside ourselves? And I, I put some on the, on the board there. Maybe we had the desire to be right. You know, I think uh, it's human nature to be right. We don't like to be wrong, do we? We don't like to be corrected. And really, that comes from a little bit of pride and self-centeredness, doesn't it? What about respect? Just like wanting to be right. We, we all want to be respected. We want to be praised and honored and appreciated. We like that. But, you know, it, it, at times that also becomes uh, a little bit prideful. What about envy? You know, are we ever think that maybe life's not fair or, or I want this and I can't get that? And maybe eventually I'll do whatever it takes to get that because we're envy of something else or someone else. You know, maybe power. I can, I can increase my power and take others down around me to get more power. You know, when we're talking about wars among the nations, we probably argue that most of those start with, with that. We want power, and we'll take you down to get more power. What about selfish addictions? You know, we get to the point with something that we like it so much that we have to do it to feel normal. You know, we can go on and on with different things that we, we go through, but the point here is that it all comes back to some pride and selfishness, and it all starts with a battle inside ourselves. You know, our, our, and with this pride and selfishness, I mean, that's, that's the, the, the key issue that, that we learn really through James, but especially in this chapter you get to the point where you care more about yourself than you care about anything else. And such selfish desires leads to making the wrong decision or maybe taking that wrong action. James says you end up murdering, fighting, starting a war. And maybe when we look at 1 John, maybe it's not physically doing that, but 1 John 3.15 says, Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. So maybe literally, too, maybe we're, we're having a war with somebody else inside of us, which leads us to a, number two. We start with battles inside of ourselves, which leads to battles with, the, with each other. You know, what happens when we start to have envy, or we go back to Cain and Abel, what happens when he had that envy inside? Well, he actually took the action and took his brother's life, didn't he? So it starts inside, and sometimes it comes to, we battle with, with each other. You know, maybe we make it, each other mad. Maybe we start hurting others physically, emotionally. We damage relationships. We start slander or start judging others, as it says in verse 11, all because, you know, our desires are not following God. And sometimes, you know, we can even... Say, with, among Christians, this is true. We could, we could see it all throughout the Bible. We talked about Cain and, Cain and Abel, but how about Lot when he quarreled, quarreled with Abraham over what land to choose 
Or how about when Absalom created a war with David in 2 Samuel? Or even in Luke 22, when the disciples were arguing with each other over who's the greatest? Or even, even the churches that we read about in the New Testament, Philippi, Galatia, Corinth. I mean, the guys in Corinth were suing each other. So battles with each other all throughout the scripture and we see in every, every day. So when we start to follow the worldly desires and not submit to God, we start with a battle inside, then we potentially battle with each other, and then ultimately we get to the third one. We're really battling with God. We can argue that this might be the root cause of every kind of battle or war that we see is we're battling with God, rebellion against God. So how do we as Christians sometimes battle against God? You know, by taking that road, when we're talking about the fork in the road, how come sometimes we take that wrong road away from God? So James mentions three roads that we, we might take when we're, when we're going off of selfish desires or earthly desires. In verse 4 he says, we're not submitting to God, we're submitting to the world. You know, worldly desires are very contrary to God, aren't they? Following what the world says is right. You know, do we ever rely on what we hear? Maybe pop culture, movies, music, media maybe peer pressure from others, trying to fit in on what others are doing. You know, that's, that's really submitting to the world. Second, he says in verse 1 and verse 5, we submit to the flesh. You know, maybe unlawful desires that lead us away from God, doing what feels right. That's kind of a lesson that we hear a lot uh, from the world is, do what makes you feel right. Do, do what feels good, right? Be happy. Well, that's really following yourself, following the flesh. Such desires are in direct conflict on what the Spirit of God would have us to do and be. I have a scripture, and I didn't write it down, so I'll read it straight from the Bible here. Uh, Galatians 5, 16, and 17 says... So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit was as contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with, with each other, so that you do not want to so that you do not do what you want. So it's also contrary to the Spirit. And then a combination of submitting to the world or submitting to the flesh is really submitting to the devil, which he talks about in verse 4, uh, 6, and 7 in our text. I think we can say that pride is one of Satan's greatest temptations. We all have pride to some degree, and, and all of our temptations come straight from Satan. You know, when we give into pride and into our strong temptations, as it says in verse 6, we become friends with the devil and enemies of God. Probably not a good place we want to be. Friends of the devil and enemies of God. Another lesson that uh, James talks about here, um, related but a little bit unrelated, is he talks about prayer, which is not which is pretty normal considering, you know, we talked about the first class of the series that, in my opinion, prayer is one of the overarching themes of James. And he talks about prayer here, but he talks about prayer in a little, from a little bit different perspective, I think. Instead about saying to pray, he, he talks about why maybe our prayers are not answered the way that we want them to be answered. You know, Maybe do we ever, do you ever get frustrated with that? Do we ever pray a little bit and, and feel like, you know, I'm not sure what, I, what I'm asking for is not really happening. Do we ever get in that situation? You know, do we ever feel, you know, I, I guess at times I've heard of people get mad at God for that, but, 
Maybe we, we feel like maybe we're not doing something right. Maybe we need to live a little bit better as a Christian. Maybe we're not doing enough. You know, I think that's things that we ask ourselves sometime. But James says that's not what he's talking about. Because James says, maybe we're asking for the wrong things. He also said, maybe we're asking with selfish motives. Maybe we're not asking for, for things that are, are good for us, or spiritually good for us, but things that we want. Or he also says, or maybe because we're not even asking at all. You know, I was always taught as a child that, uh, you know, God was, would say yes sometimes, he'll say no sometimes, or he'll say maybe later, right? And I think that's true. But maybe, uh, maybe it's because we're doing these things. Maybe we're not asking for the right thing. Maybe we're asking for what we want and not what God may want. Or not asking for him to lead us in the right direction, and we're asking for what we want in our own direction. You know, do you ever, ever ask for earthly gains, maybe a, a job or, you know, things that, that we want, but, well, maybe that's, that's why we're not getting what we want, because it's not the best for us. So how should we pray, or what should we pray for? If we look at 1 John five, fourteen, it says, says, this is the confidence that we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And then Jesus says in John 15, 7, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And then Jesus again in John 14, 14, You may ask me anything in my name and I will do it. Now to ask in Jesus' name is not going to be a guaranteed action, but I think what it means in putting all these verses together is action will happen according to God's will. So sometimes it might not feel that God is listening to us, or maybe prayers are not getting answered the way we want. But I think the lesson here is never stop praying. We know that. We are told to pray continually, and God answers prayers in the way things need to happen, in his own will, which is another reason that we are asked to submit to God's will. So when it comes to the fork in the road or, or praying, you know, how do we know what the right thing to do is? You know, we, we talk about all these things, you know, we we're, we're, we're have a decision that we need to choose to go left or go right. You know, maybe not even a, a good and bad situation, maybe it's a, a good and better situation. How do we, how we, how do we know what to do? Or what does James tell us what to do? You know, I think he gives us some four basic guidelines on what to do. And the first one is the easiest one because it's the title of the lesson, Submit to God. He says, surrender ourselves to God. I mean, that's the only way to go, right? Because to submit is really us making the decision that it is not my will, but thine be done. Not what I want, but allow God to take care of me, or allow God to take care of us. You know, uh, the, the word submit means to put oneself under authority, admonition, or control of. So we are to submit to God, put ourselves under God's authority and control. If we talk about the greatest commandment, it says what? I love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. You know, the only way we can grow spiritually is to submit to God. The second thing, or second guideline, is resist the devil. And I think we could probably say that resisting God, uh, submit to God and resist to the devil are almost parallel items. You kind of have to do both together. But you have to submit to God and resist the devil. You know, he's behind everything we have in every war that we have inside and out. Our battles inside, our battles outside, it comes from, it comes from Satan. 
We have to be aware of the temptations and eatable desires that he gives to us. You know, we know it's, it's everywhere. Resisting the devil goes along with submitting to God. We are in a spiritual war with battles every day. You know, the, the, really the devil's work is to keep us from submitting to God, right? He's trying to break that submission that we have to God. First Peter says, and I used this a few weeks ago, but First Peter 5, Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a worn lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in faith. The third one, it says in verse 8, Draw near to God, or come near to God. It says to cleanse or wash your hands. You know, make that decision. Get your, your, your sins resolved. Be baptized. And purify your hearts. It says be single-minded in your devotion. It says that we, when we're double-minded, we're like spiritual adulterers. You know, we can't love God sometimes and then love something else other times. If you're doing that, you're not, you're not submitting to God. So we, we, we can't just love God when we think it's convenient or when, and we, when we feel like it, but always. And then in verse 9 and 10, it says, Humble yourself in the sight of God. You know, I think it's possible at times to, in a sense, be a spiritual adulterer and then, you know, we come to worship and we can do the motions externally. We can say the right thing. We can act the, the right way. But maybe inside we're not there. You know, we've got to humble ourselves in the sight of God. It says in, in uh, verse 10, if we can show humility both inside and out, God will lift you up. So, James reminds us that we must humbly submit to God and resist the devil. We must pray and forgive each other fellow Christians, ourselves, instead of quarreling and slandering and starting wars with each other or within ourselves. You know, we have to submit to God and take the, that high road. I'm going to get end with 1 John chapter 2, where it says, starting in verse 15, it says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. And I think that's going back to the reward for those of us who do make the decision to limit our pride and submit to God. And I'm going to read the, the last verse, well, next to last verse, verse 11 from our text today. Because it says, there is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. So I think, what I think about when I, I'm reading this is, let's submit to this judge and follow his will and not our own. Let's uh, close in prayer.